he took a little card. He, he, he's holding these salesmen, you know, meetings for the salesmen all across the nation. And so he just took a little card like that, little old, you know, index card, three by five, and he just had four names written on it, four things. And, and the number one was faith. Faith. You've got to believe in your product. You've got to believe you can sell it. Amen. Well, that faith paid off. That faith paid off. He made more money, actually became a rich man, became a millionaire. And, uh, uh, and, and, and actually, they wanted to make him president, but he said, I'm not going to set it in a desk. And so he just resigned and went out doing something else. But nonetheless, nonetheless, his faith, it's a natural, it wasn't spiritual faith, that's a natural faith. But how much more? I said, how much more? Will faith, praise God, of the heart. Amen. Amen. Faith in God. Faith in God's word. Faith in what God said. Woo! Glory to God. Pay off. Hallelujah. So faith is of the heart, not the head. This faith is. This God kind of faith is of the heart, not the head. Then we notice it says, and when you stand praying, forgive now, it wouldn't take you very long to forgive if you're standing because you can't stand on it forever, you know. <laughs> Amen. No, you can do it. If God said do it, you can do it. Forgive. Forgive. Faith will not work in an unforgiving heart. I tell the story very often, and it'll, I could tell you many of them, but this is a good one and a bear repetition. Uh, I, we were, I, I'd met this young couple, a priest, a convention, an national, international convention for this particular full gospel denomination a number of years ago. And uh, I met this young couple. They were ministers, both of them graduates of the Bible school of that particular group and, and ordained to the ministry. And so then I'm conducting a meeting in 1950, March of 1957 in Vancouver, Washington, just across the river from Portland, you know, uh, Oregon. And, uh, and this young couple at that time, were not, uh, they'd built two churches and established them, turned them over to pastors, and they're just sort of here resting between times, and that's their home church. And so the very first service, after the very first service, they invited my wife and I to go with them to have a sandwich. So we went to a restaurant. We're sitting in a booth. I'm right across from her, and uh, we're having ordered us a sandwich and a glass of milk. And, uh, and she said, Brother Hagin, you've got me all confused. No, I said, sister, I didn't get you confused. You was confused before I got here. (laughs) The the light of God's word just showed up your confusion. Well, she said, I said, why? What's your problem? Well, she said, in your sermon tonight, you'll preach. See, sometimes God will have you to say things and not even in connection with what you're talking about. He ministers to people. And and this wasn't in my message, but somewhere I got off on it. First epistle of John, there about 13th to 14th verses. In the fifth chapter, he said, you know, uh, he that hateth his brother is a murderer. Now it said, first, the other verse, first verse said, we know we pass from death unto life because we love the brother. But he that hateth his brother, and I stopped and said that means mother-in-law too. <laughs> she, she quoted me. I said, well, I did. I plead guilty. I certainly did. What's your problem? I said, I hate my mother-in-law. Now you mean here's an ordained Pentecostal, full gospel, tongue-talking minister? that hates her mother-in-law? Well, she said she did. Well, I said, you're a murderer then. Well, she said, Brother Hagin, you know my mother and daddy, my parents. Uh, they, I, and I had met them in the process. Uh, they, I was born, you know, in those days, children were born at home. Both of our children were born in their home. I was born in a Pentecostal parsonage, raised up in a Pentecostal full gospel church. Got saved at an early age, filled with the Holy Ghost, just as a, a, a little tyke. And then felt the call of God to the ministry, graduated from high school, went to Bible school, met my husband there. And we, we were married. It's the last year, senior year of, of, of uh, Bible school. And we went out to a town, a city, little, little, pretty good-sized town. Didn't have any full gospel church back years ago. No full gospel church. We pioneered a new work. Built it, built a church building, got the thing up, you know, two, three hundred people. Turned it over to a pastor because that wasn't our call. And we went over to another town and started a work. Turned that over to a pastor. Now here, we're just here between times, so to speak, going to this church, waiting on God to see what he wants us to do next. Done all that. I said, I don't care how much you did. 
for God or how much you didn't do. If you hate your mother-in-law, you're a murderer. Now, isn't that true? If you hate anybody, you're a murderer. And you know, no murderer has eternal life abiding in I, 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 I get disturbed about a lot of these. I hear people say sometimes, I just hate old so-and-so. Talking about a fellow Christian. Well, you won't look up and say, murder. Yeah. But that'd go over big, you know. With it. No, they need to wake up. Amen. Yeah. Well, I saw that I had her on the ropes. You know what I mean by that. She's about out. I said, sister, look me right in the face, across the table in this booth and the rest of it, and say I hate my mother-in-law, and at the same time, check down here on the inside of you. She said, I hate my mother-in-law. I said, what happened down there? She said, there's something down there scratching me. I said, yeah, the Bible said the love of God has been shed and brought in our hearts. The love of God is down there trying to signal to you, trying to get your attention. You're ignoring it. See, that's what most people are doing. They're living out of the flesh, dominating by the flesh, or out of their head. The love of God hadn't been shed abroad in your head. Love of God hadn't been shed abroad in your flesh. Amen. So she said, what am I going to do? I said, you're going to act like you love your mother-in-law because you do. See, love, like faith, is revealed in word and action. It's safe to say there is no love or faith either without word or action. Amen. 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 So act. How would you act if you did love your mother-in-law? Well, act it. Well, we were in that church for three weeks. And this happened the very first service. But the second week, we, we took Saturday off. She came to my wife and said, I've invited my mother-in-law and my two sisters-in-law. Their husband's over to the house after church tonight for refreshments. Would you and Brother Hagin come? My wife said, well, ordinarily Brother Hagin don't do that, but I'll ask him. So, you know, you can't go everywhere. But if God says go, you go. So God said go, so we went. She slipped around and said to me, you know, you're right. I don't hate my mother-in-law. I let some things get in the way, you know. Uh, and said, these are wonderful people. Love God. I was just wrong. But we discovered, we didn't even know because we met them at the convention and we, didn't, we saw them in the services here. But, uh, you know, they had nursery and, and a children's thing going on. And, and so uh, uh, we didn't know whether they had any children or not. But we found out, they're about 30 years of age. We found out they had three children. We found out when we were there in the home, when this, we found out that the youngest one, a little girl, three and a half, four years old, beautiful little blue-eyed, blonde-headed girl, that uh, the, for the first two years of her life was just perfect, but at two years of age began to have epileptic seizures. And they had taken her to different doctors and finally took her to Los Angeles. To, other doctors said this is the world's leading specialist in that area. And this doctor said, treating nothing but, epile- ep- but those with epilepsy for, uh, for, 50, for 38 years. This is the worst case I've ever seen. Now, there's no cure for it, but you could take in, in those days, and I haven't done too much yet, but uh, you could take medication, metric lighter. And so, before you go into the main attack, there's a little preliminary attack. So we're getting ready to go to church. I'm preaching faith and healing, and they're trying to believe God for the healing of that child. And so she called the motel and said, would we stop by on the way to church, just almost on the road, two blocks off, and pray for the child. Well, you can't go in your meetings and pray for everybody. If you did, that's all you'd be doing. And you'd wear yourself out and wouldn't be ready for the service. But when God says go, you go. Amen. The Lord said, my wife answered the phone, and she told me about it. I said, the Lord said, go. So I said, tell her, tell her we'll be around there in about 10 minutes. Well, we got in the car and started. Now, just my wife and I in the front seat, but it's just like somebody sitting in the back seat, and ain't nobody back there. A man's voice. My wife didn't hear it, but said, uh, don't pray for the child. Don't anoint the child with oil. Don't lay hands on the child. See, all those things are scriptural. But sometimes God wants to do some things different, you know. So don't lay hands on the child. When you get there, say to the mother, I said to Israel under the old covenant, walk in my statutes and keep my commandments. Do that which is right in my sight and I'll take sickness away from the midst of you. And the number of your days you'll fulfill. Paraphrasing that, 